The Rime of the Ancient Mariner by Samuel Taylor Coleridge It is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long gray beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? The bridegroom's doors are open wide, and I am next of kin. The guests are met, the feast is set, mayest hear the merry din. He holds him with his skinny hand. There was a ship, quoth he. Hold off, unhand me, greybeard loon. Eftsoons his hand dropped he. He holds him with his glittering eye. The wedding guest stood still, and listens like a three years child. The mariner hath his will. The wedding guest sat on a stone. He cannot choose but hear. And thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. The ship was cheered, the harbor cleared, dropped below the kirk, below the hill, below the lighthouse top. The sun came up upon the left, out sea came he, and he shone bright, and on the right went down into the sea. Higher and higher every day, till over the mast at noon, the wedding guest here beat his breast, for he heard the loud bassoon. The bride hath paced into the hall, red as a rose is she, nodding their heads before her goes the merry minstrelsy. The wedding guest he beat his breast, yet he cannot choose but hear, and thus spake on that ancient man, the bright-eyed mariner. And now the storm-blast came, and he was tyrannous and strong. He struck with his o'ertaking wings and chased us south along, with sloping masts and dipping prow, as who pursued with yell and blow, still treads the shadow of his foe and forward bends his head. The ship drove fast, loud roared the blast, and southward I we fled. And now there came both mist and snow, and it grew wondrous cold, and ice mast high came floating by as green as emerald. And through the drifts the snowy cliffs did send a dismal sheen, Nor shapes of men nor beasts we kin, The ice was all between. The ice was here, the ice was there, the ice was all around. It cracked and growled and roared and howled like noises in a swound. At length did cross an albatross. Through the fog it came, as if it had been a Christian soul, we hailed it in God's name. It ate the food it ne'er had eat, and round and round it flew. The ice did split with a thunder fit, the helmsman steered us through. And a good south wind sprung up behind, the albatross did follow, and every day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. In mist or cloud, on mast or shroud, it perched for vespers nine, whiles all the night through fog smoke white glimmered the white moonshine. God save thee, ancient mariner, from the fiends that plague thee thus. Why lookest thou so, who's upon the right? Out of the sea came he, still hid in mist, and on the left went down into the sea. And the good south wind still blew behind, and no sweet bird did follow, nor any day for food or play came to the mariner's hollow. And I had done a hellish thing, and it would work em woe, for all averred I had killed the bird that made the breeze to blow. Ah, wretch, said they, the bird to slay that made the breeze to blow, nor dim nor red like God's own head the glorious sun uprist. Then all averred I had killed the bird that brought the fog and mist. T'was right, said they, such birds to slay that bring the fog and mist. The fair breeze blew, the white foam flew, the furrow followed free. We were the first that ever burst into that silent sea. Down dropped the breeze, the sails dropped down, T'was sad as sad could be, And we did speak only to break the silence of the sea. All in a hot and copper sky, the bloody sun at noon, Right up above the mast did stand, no bigger than the moon. Day after day, day after day we struck, nor breath nor motion, as idle as a painted ship upon a painted ocean. 
Water, water everywhere, and all the boards did shrink. Water, water everywhere, nor any drop to drink. The very deep did rot, O oh Christ, that ever this should be. Yet slimy things did crawl with legs upon the slimy sea. About, about in reel and rout, the death fires danced at night. The water, like a witch's oils, burnt green and blue and white. And some in dreams assured were of the spirit that plagued us so. Nine fathoms deep he had followed us from the land of mist and snow. And every tongue through utter drought was withered at the root. We could not speak no more than if we had been choked with soot. Ah, well a day, what evil looks had I from old and young. Instead of the cross, the albatross about my neck was hung. There passed a weary time. Each throat was parched and glazed each eye. A weary time, a weary time, how glazed each weary eye. When looking westward I beheld a something in the sky. At first it seemed a little speck, and then it seemed a mist. It moved and moved and took at last a certain shape, I wist. A speck, a mist, a shape, I wist. And still it neared and neared as if it dodged a water sprite. It plunged and tacked and veered. With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, we could not laugh nor wail. Through utter drought, all dumb we stood. I bit my arm, I sucked the blood, and cried, A sail! A sail! With throats unslaked, with black lips baked, agape they heard me call, Gramercy! They for joy did grin, and all at once their breath drew in, as they were drinking all. See, see, I cried, she tacks no more, hither to work us wheel, without a breeze, without a tide, she steadies with upright keel. The western wave was all aflame, the day was well nigh done, almost upon the western wave rested the broad, bright sun, when that strange shape drove suddenly betwixt us and the sun. And straight the sun was flecked with bars. Heaven's mother send us grace, as if through a dungeon grate he peered with broad and burning face. Alas, thought I, and my heart beat loud, how fast she nears and nears. Are those her sails that glance in the sun like restless gossamers? Are those her ribs through which the sun did peer as through a grate? And is that woman all her crew? Is that a death? And are there two? Is death that woman's mate? Her lips were red, her looks were free, her locks were yellow as gold. Her skin was white as leprosy. The nightmare life in death was she who thicks man's blood with cold. The naked hulk alongside came, and the twain were casting die. The game is done, I've won, I've won, quoth she, and whistles thrice. The sun's rim dips, the stars rush out as one stride comes the dark. With far heard whisper o'er the sea, off shot the specter bark. We listened and looked sideways up, fear at my heart as at a cup my life blood seemed to sip. The stars were dim and thick the night. The steersman's face by his lamp gleamed white from the sails. The dew did drip till clumb above the eastern bar the horned moon with one bright star within the nether tip. One after one by the star-dogged moon, too quick for groan or sigh, each turned his face with a ghastly pang and cursed me with his eye. Four times fifty living men, and I heard nor sigh nor groan. With heavy thump, a lifeless lump, they dropped down one by one. The souls did from their bodies fly. They fled to bliss or woe, and every soul it passed me by like the whiz of my crossbow. I fear thee, ancient mariner, 
I fear thy skinny hand, and thou art long and lank and brown, as is the ribbed sea sand. I fear thee and thy glittering eye, and thy skinny hand so brown. Fear not, fear not, thou wedding guest, this body drop not down, alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. And never a saint took pity on my soul in agony. The many men so beautiful, and they all dead did lie, and a thousand, thousand slimy things lived on, and so did I. I looked upon the rotting sea, and drew my eyes away. I looked upon the rotting deck, and there the dead men lay. I looked to heaven, and tried to pray, but or ever a prayer had gushed, a wicked whisper came and made my heart as dry as dust. I closed my lids, and kept them close, and the balls like pulses beat, for the sky and the sea and the sea and the sky lay like a load on my weary eye, and the dead were at my feet. The cold sweat melted from their limbs, nor rot nor reek did they. The look which with they looked on me had never passed away. An orphan's curse would drag to hell a spirit from on high, but oh, more horrible than that is the curse in a dead man's eye. Seven days, seven nights I saw that curse, and yet I could not die. The moving moon went up the sky, and nowhere did abide. Softly she was going up, and a star or two beside. Her beams bemocked the sultry main, like April hoarfrost spread. But where the ship's huge shadow lay, the charmed water burnt all way a still and awful red. Beyond the shadow of the ship I watched the water snakes. They moved in tracks of shining white, and when they reared, the elfish light fell off in hoary flakes. Within the shadow of the ship I watched their rich attire, Blue, glossy green, and velvet black, they coiled and swam, and every track was a flash of golden fire. O oh, happy living things, no tongue their beauty might declare. A spring of love gushed from my heart, and I blessed them unaware. Sure, my kind saint took pity on me, and I blessed them unaware. The selfsame moment I could pray, and from my neck so free the albatross fell off and sank like lead into the sea. Oh, sleep, it is a gentle thing, beloved from pole to pole. To Queen Mary the praise be given. She sent the gentle sleep from heaven that slid into my soul. The silly buckets on the deck that had so long remained, I dreamt that they were filled with dew, and when I awoke, it rained. My lips were wet, my throat was cold, my garments all were dank. Sure, I had drunken in my dreams, and still my body drank. I moved and could not feel my limbs, I was so light. Almost I thought that I had died in sleep and was a blessed ghost. And soon I heard a roaring wind. It did not come near, but with its sound it shook the sails that were so thin and sear. The upper air burst into life, and a hundred fire flags sheen. To and fro they were hurried about, and to and fro and in and out the one stars danced between. And the coming wind did roar more loud, and the sails did sigh like sedge. And the rain poured down from one black cloud. The moon was at its edge. The thick black cloud was cleft, and still the moon was at its side, like waters shot from some high crag. The lightning fell with never a jag, a river steep and wide. The loud wind never reached the ship. Yet now the ship moved on. Beneath the lightning and the moon, the dead men gave a groan. 
They groaned, they stirred, they all uprose, nor spake, nor spake, nor moved their eyes. It had been strange even in a dream to have seen those dead men rise. The helmsman steered, the ship moved on, yet never a breeze up blew. The mariners all gone work the ropes where they were wont to do. They raised their limbs like lifeless tools. We were a ghastly crew. The body of my brother's son stood by me knee to knee. The body and I pulled at one rope, but he said not to me. I fear thee, ancient mariner. Be calm, thou wedding guest. T'was not those souls that fled in pain which to their courses came again, but a troop of spirits blessed. For when it dawned they dropped their arms and clustered round the mast. Sweet sounds rose slowly through their mouths and from their bodies passed. Around, around flew each sweet sound, then darted to the sun. Slowly the sounds came back again, now mixed, now one by one. Sometimes a dropping from the sky I heard the skylark sing. Sometimes all little birds that are how they seem to fill the sea and air with their sweet jargoning. And now t'was like all instruments, now like a lonely flute, and now it is an angel's song that makes the heavens be mute. It ceased, yet still the sails made on a pleasant noise till noon, a noise like of a hidden brook in the leafy month of June that to the sleeping woods all night singeth a quiet tune. Till noon we quietly sailed on, Yet never a breeze did breathe. Slowly and smoothly went the ship, moved onward from beneath. Under the keel, nine fathoms deep, from the land of mist and snow, the spirit slid, and it was he that made the ship to go. The sails at noon left off their tune, and the ship stood still also. The sun, right up above the mast, had fixed her in the ocean. But in a minute she gone stir with a short, uneasy motion, backwards and forwards, half her length with a short, uneasy motion. Then, like a pawing horse let go, she made a sudden bound. It flung the blood into my head, and I fell down in a swound. How long in that same fit I lay, I have not to declare. But ere my living life returned, I heard and in my soul discerned two voices in the air. Is it he, quoth one, is this the man by him who died on cross? With his cruel bow he laid low the harmless albatross. The spirit who bideth by himself in the land of mist and snow he loved the bird that loved the man who shot him with his bow. The other was a softer voice, as soft as honey-dew. Quoth he, The man hath penance done, and penance more will do. But tell me, tell me, speak again, thy soft response renewing. What makes that ship drive on so fast? What is the ocean doing? Still as a slave before his lord the ocean hath no blast, his great bright eye most silently up to the moon is cast. If he may know which way to go, for she guides him smooth or grim, see, brother, see how graciously she looketh down on him. But why drives on that ship so fast without or wave or wind? The air is cut away before and closes from behind. Fly, brother, fly, more high, more high, or we shall be belated. For slow and slow that ship will go when the mariner's trance is abated. I woke, and we were sailing on as in a gentle weather. T'was night, calm night, the moon was high. The dead men stood together. All stood together on the deck For a charnel dungeon fitter, 
All fixed on me their stony eyes that in the moon did glitter. The pang, the curse with which they died had never passed away. I could not draw my eyes from theirs nor turn them up to pray. And now the spell was snapped once more. I viewed the ocean green and looked far forth, yet little saw of what had else been seen. Like one that on a lonesome road doth walk in fear and dread, and having once turned round walks on and turns no more his head, because he knows a frightful fiend doth close behind him tread. But soon there breathed a wind on me, nor sound nor motion made, its path was not upon the sea, in ripple or in shade. It raised my hair, it fanned my cheek like a meadow gale of spring. It mingled strangely with my fears, yet it felt like a welcoming. Swiftly, swiftly flew the ship, yet she sailed softly too. Swiftly, swiftly blew the breeze, on me alone it blew. Oh, dream of joy, is this indeed the lighthouse top I see? Is this the hill? Is this the kirk? Is this mine own country? We drifted o'er the harbor bar, and I with sobs did pray, Oh, let me be awake, O oh God, or let me sleep all way. The harbor bay was clear as glass, so smoothly it was strewn, and on the bay the moonlight lay in the shadow of the moon. The rock shone bright, the kirk no less that stands above the rock, the moonlight steeped in silentness, the steady weathercock. And the bay was white with silent light, till rising from the same full many shapes that shadows were in crimson colors came. A little distance from the prow those crimson shadows were. I turned my eyes upon the deck, O oh Christ, what saw I there? Each course lay flat, lifeless and flat, and by the holy rood. A man all alight, a seraph man on every course there stood. This seraph band each waved his hand. It was a heavenly sight. They stood as signals to the land, each one a lovely light. This seraph band each waved his hand. No voice did they impart, no voice, but oh, the silence sank like music on my heart. But soon I heard the dash of oars, I heard the pilot's cheer, my head was turned perforce away, and I saw a boat appear, the pilot and the pilot's boy, I heard them coming fast, dear Lord in heaven it was a joy, the dead men could not blast, I saw a third. I saw his voice. It is the hermit, good. He singeth loud his godly hymns that he makes in the wood. He'll shrieve my soul. He'll wash away the albatross's blood. This hermit, good, lives in that wood which slopes down to the sea. How loudly his sweet voice he rears. He loves to talk with mariners that come from a far country. He kneels at morn and noon and eve. He hath a cushion plump. It is the moss that wholly hides the rotted old oak stump. The skiff boat neared, I heard them talk. Why, this is strange, I trow. Where are those lights so many and fair that signal made but now? Strange by my faith, the hermit said. And they answered not our cheer. The planks looked warped, and see those sails, how thin they are and sear. I never saw aught like to them, each perchance it were, brown skeletons of leaves that lag my forest brook along. When the ivy tot is heavy with snow, and the owlet whoops to the wolf below that eats the she-wolf's young. Dear Lord, it hath a fiendish look, the pilot made reply. I am afeard. Push on, push on, said the hermit cheerily. The boat came closer to the ship, but I nor spake nor stirred. The boat came close beneath the ship, and straight a sound was heard. 
Under the water it rumbled on, still louder and more dread. It reached the ship, it split the bay, the ship went down like lead. Stunned by that loud and dreadful sound which sky and ocean smote, like one that had been seven days drowned, my body lay afloat. But swift as dreams myself I found within the pilot's boat. Upon the swirl where sank the ship, the boat spun round and round, and all was still, save that the hill was telling of the sound. I moved my lips. The pilot shrieked and fell down in a fit. The holy hermit raised his eyes and prayed where he did sit. I took the oars. The pilot's boy, who now doth crazy go, laughed loud and long, and all the while his eyes went to and fro. Ha ha, quoth he, for plain I see the devil knows how to row. And now all in my own country I stood on the firm land. The hermit stepped forth from the boat, and scarcely he could stand. Oh, shrieve me, shrieve me, holy man! The hermit crossed his brow. Say quick, quoth he, I bid thee say, what manner of man art thou? Forthwith this frame of mine was wrenched with a woeful agony, which forced me to begin my tale, and then it left me free. Since then, at an uncertain hour, that agony returns, until my ghastly tale is told, this heart within me burns. I pass like night from land to land. I have strange power of speech. That moment that his face I see, I know the man that must hear me to tell him my tale I teach. What loud uproars bursts from that door, the wedding guests are there, but in the garden bower the bride and bridemaids singing are, and hark the little vesper bell which biddeth me to prayer. O wedding guest, this soul hath been alone on a wide, wide sea. So lonely t'was that God himself scarce seemed there to be. O oh, sweeter than the marriage feast, tis sweeter far to me to walk together to the kirk with a goodly company, to walk together to the kirk and all together pray, while each to his great father bends, old men and babes and loving friends and youths and maidens gay. Farewell, farewell, but this I tell to thee, thou wedding guest, he prayeth well who loveth well both man and bird and beast. He prayeth best who loveth best all things both great and small, for the dear God who loveth us he made and loveth all. The mariner whose eye is bright, whose beard with age is hoar is gone, and now the wedding guest turned from the bridegroom's door. He went like one that hath been stunned, and is of sense forlorn, a sadder and a wiser man. He rose the morrow morn. Lars Porsena of Clusium, by the nine gods he swore that the great house of Tarquin should suffer wrong no more. By the nine gods he swore it, and named a trysting day, and bade his messengers ride forth, east and west and south and north, to summon his array. East and west and south and north the messengers ride fast, and town and town and cottage have heard the trumpet's blast. Shame on the false Etruscan who lingers in his home when Porsena of Clusium is on the march for Rome. The horsemen and the footmen are pouring in amain from many a stately marketplace, from many a fruitful plain, from many a lonely hamlet, which hid by beech and pine, like an eagle's nest hangs on the crest of purple Apennine. From lordly Volatere, where scowls the far-famed hold, piled by the hands of giants for godlike kings of old. Far from Seagirt Papalonia, whose sentinels descry Sardinia's snowy mountain tops fringing the southern sky. 
from the proud mart of Pizay, queen of the western waves, where ride Massilia's triremes, heavy with fair-haired slaves, from where sweet Clannis wanders through corn and vines and flowers, from where Cortona lifts to heaven her diadem of towers, tall are the oaks whose acorns drop in dark Osser's rill, fat are the stags that champ the boughs of the Ciminian hill, Beyond all streams, Clitumnus is the herdsman dear. Best of all pools, the fowler loves the great Volsonian mere. But now no stroke of woodman is heard by Osser's rill. No hunter tracks the stag's green path up the Ciminian hill. Unwatched along Clitumnus grazes the milk-white steer. Unharmed, the waterfowl may dip in the Volsinian mere. The harvests of Aretium this year old men reap. This year young boys in Umbro shall plunge the struggling sheep. And in the vats of Luna this year the must shall foam round the white feet of laughing girls whose sires have marched to Rome. There be thirty chosen prophets, the wisest of the land, who always by Lars Porsena both morn and evening stand. Evening and morn the thirty have turned the verses o'er, traced from the right on linen white by mighty seers of yore. And with one voice the thirty have their glad answer given, Go forth, go forth, Lars Porsena, go forth, beloved of heaven, go and return in glory to Clusium's round dome, and hang round Nursia's altars the golden shields of Rome. And now hath every city sent up her tale of men, the foot are fourscore thousand, the horses are thousands ten. Before the gates of Sutrium is met the great array, a proud man was Lars Porsena upon the trysting day. For all the Tuscan armies were ranged beneath his eye, and many a banished Roman, and many a stout ally. And with a mighty following to join the muster came the Tusculan Mamilius, prince of the Latian name. But by the yellow Tiber was tumult and affright. From all the spacious champagnes to Rome men took their flight. A mile around the city the throng stopped up the ways. A fearful sight it was to see through two long nights and days. For aged folks on crutches and women great with child and mothers sobbing over babes that clung to them and smiled and sick men born in litters high on the necks of slaves, and troops of sunburned husbandmen with reaping hooks and staves, and droves of mules and asses laden with skins of wine, and endless flocks of goats and sheep, and endless herds of kine, and endless trains of wagons that creaked beneath the weight of corn sacks and of household goods choked every roaring gate. Now from the rock of Tarpeian could the wan burghers spy the line of blazing villages red in the midnight sky. The fathers of the city, they sat all night and day, for every hour some horsemen came with tidings of dismay. To eastward and to westward have spread the Tuscan bands, nor house, nor fence, nor dovecote in Crustumerium stands. Verbena down in Ostia hath wasted all the plain, Aster hath stormed Janiculum, and the stout guards are slain. I whiz, in all the senate there was no heart so bold, but sore it ached and fast it beat when that ill news was told. Forthwith up rose the consul, up rose the fathers all. In haste they girded up their gowns and hied them to the wall. They held a council standing before the river gate. Short time was there, ye may well guess, from musing or debate. Out spake the consul roundly. The bridge must straight go down, for since Janiculum is lost, naught else can save the town. Just then a scout came flying, all wild with haste and fear. To arms! To arms, Sir Consul! Lars Porson is here! On the low hills to westward the consul fixed his eye, and saw the swarthy storm of dust rise fast along the sky, and nearer fast and nearer doth the red whirlwind come, and louder still and still more loud from underneath that whirling cloud is heard the trumpet's war note proud, the trampling and the hum. And plainly and more plainly now through the gloom appears, far to left and far to right in broken gleams of dark 
blue light, the long array of helmets bright, the long array of spears. And plainly and more plainly above that glimmering line, now might ye see the banners of twelve fair cities shine. But the banner of proud Clusium was highest of them all, the terror of the Umbrian, the terror of the Gaul. And plainly and more plainly, now might the burghers know, by port and vest, by horse and crest, each warlike Lucamo. There Silnius of Aretium on his fleet roan was seen, an aster of the fourfold shield, girt with the brand none else may wield. Tolumnius with the belt of gold, and dark verbena from the hold by reedy Thracemene. Fast by the royal standard, o'erlooking all the war, Lars Porsena of Clusium sat in his ivory car. By the right wheel rode Mamilius, prince of the Latian name, and by the left fought Sextus, who wrought the deed of shame. But when the face of Sextus was seen among the foes, a yell that rent the firmament from all the town arose. On the housetops was no woman but spat toward him and hissed, no child but screamed out curses and shook its little fist. But the consul's brow was sad, and the consul's speech was low. And darkly looked he at the wall, and darkly at the foe. Their van will be upon us before the bridge goes down, and if they once might win the bridge, what hope to save the town? Then out spoke brave Horatius, the captain of the gate. To every man upon this earth death cometh soon or late, and how can man die better than facing fearful odds? For the ashes of his fathers and the temples of his gods and for the tender mother who dandled him to rest, and for the wife who nurses his baby at her breast, and for the holy maidens who feed the eternal flame to save them from false sextus that wrought the deed of shame. Hew down the bridge, Sir Consul, with all speed ye may, I with two more to help me will hold the foe in play. In yon straight path a thousand may well be stopped by three. Now who will stand on either side and keep the bridge with me? Then out spake Spurius Lartius, a Ramnian proud was he. Lo, I'll stand at thy right hand and keep the bridge with thee. And out spake strong Herminius, of Titian blood was he. I will abide on thy left and keep the bridge with thee. Horatius, quoth the consul, as thou sayest, so let it be. And straight against that great array forth went the dauntless three. For Romans in Rome's quarrel spared neither land nor gold, nor son nor wife, nor limb nor life in the brave days of old. Then none was for a party, then all were for the state. Then the great man helped the poor, and the poor man loved the great. Then lands were fairly portioned, then spoils were fairly sold. The Romans were like brothers in the brave days of old. Now Roman is like to Roman more hateful than a foe, and the tribunes beard the high, and the fathers grind the low, as we wax hot in faction, in the battle we wax cold. Wherefore men fight not as they fought in the brave days of old. Now while the three were tightening their harness on their backs, the consul was the foremost man to take in hand an axe. And fathers mixed with commons seized hatchet, bar, and crow, and smote upon the planks above and loosed the props below. Meanwhile the Tuscan army, right glorious to behold, came flashing back the noonday light, rank behind rank like surges bright of a broad sea of gold. Four hundred trumpets sounded a peal of warlike glee as that great host with measured tread and spears advanced and ensign spread rolled slowly toward the bridge's head where stood the dauntless three. The three stood calm and silent and looked upon the foes and a great shout of laughter from all the vanguard rose and forth three chiefs came spurring before the deep array to earth they sprang, their swords they drew, and lifted high their shields, and flew to win the narrow way. On us from green to Fernum, lord of the hill of vines, and see us, whose eight hundred slaves sicken in Ilva's mines, 
and Picus, long to Clusium vassal in peace and war, who led to fights his Umbrian powers from that gray crag where girt with towers the fortress of Naquinum lowers over the pale waves of Nar. Stout Larchius hurled down Annas into the street beneath. Herminius struck at Seus and clove him to the teeth. At Picus brave Horatius darted one fiery thrust, and the proud Umbrian's golden arms clashed to the bloody dust. Then Ochnus of Phileri rushed on the Roman three, and Lausulus of Ergo, the rover of the sea, and Aarons of Volsinium, who slew the great wild boar, the great wild boar that had his din amidst the reeds of Cosa's fin, and wasted fields, and slaughtered men along Albinia's shore. Herminius smote down Aarons, Larchius laid Ochnus low. Right to the heart of Lausulus, Horatius sent a blow. Lie there, he cried, fell pirate, no more aghast and pale from Ostia's wall, the crowd shall mark the track of thy destroying bark. No more Campania's hinds shall fly to woods and caverns when they spy thy thrice accursed sail. But now no sound of laughter was heard among the foes. A wild and wrathful clamor from all the vanguard rose. Six spears' lengths from the entrance halted that deep array, and for a space no man came forth to win the narrow way. But hark, the cry is Aster, and lo, the ranks divide, and the great lord of Luna comes with his stately stride. Upon his ample shoulders clangs loud the fourfold shield, and in his hands he shakes the brand which none but he can wield. He smiled on those bold Romans, a smile serene and high. He eyed the flinching Tuscans, and scorn was in his eye. Quoth he, The she-wolf's litter stands savagely at bay, but will ye dare to follow if Aster clears the way? Then, whirling up his broadsword with both hands to the height, he rushed against Horatius and smote with all his might. With shield and blade, Horatius right deftly turned the blow. The blow yet turned came yet too nigh. It missed his helm, but gashed his thigh. The Tuscans raised a joyful cry to see the red blood flow. He reeled, and on Herminius he leaned one breathing space. Then, like a wild cat, mad with wounds, sprang right at Aster's face. Through teeth and skull and helmet so fierce a thrust he sped, the good sword stood a handbreadth out behind the Tuscan's head. And the great lord of Luna fell at that deadly stroke, as falls on Mount Alvernus a thunder-smited oak. Far were the crashing forest, the giant arms lay spread, and the pale augurs, muttering low, gaze on the blasted head. On Aster's throat Horatius right firmly pressed his heel, and thrice and four times tugged amain ere he wrenched out the steel. And see, he cried, the welcome, fair guests, that waits you here. What noble Lacumo comes next to taste our room and cheer? But at his haughty challenge a sullen murmur ran, mingled of wrath and shame and dread along that glittering van. There lacked not man of prowess, nor men of lordly race, for all Etruria's noblest were round the fatal place, but all Etruria's noblest felt their hearts sink to see on the earth the bloody corpses, in their path the dauntless three. And from the ghastly entrance where those bold Romans stood, all shrank like boys who, unaware, ranging the woods to start a hare, come to the mouth of a dark lair, where, growling low, a fierce old bear lies amidst bones and blood. Was none who would be foremost to lead such dire attack? But those behind cried, Forward! And those before cried, Back! And backward now and forward wavers the deep array, and on the tossing sea of steel to and fro the standards reel, and the victorious trumpet peal dies fitfully away. Yet one man for one moment strode out before the crowd. Well known was he to all the three, and they gave him greeting loud. Now welcome, welcome, Sextus, now welcome to thy home. Why dost thou stay and turn away? Here lies the road to Rome. 
Thrice looked he at the city, thrice looked he at the dead, and thrice came on in fury, and thrice turned back in dread, and white with fear and hatred scowled at the narrow way where wallowing in a pool of blood the bravest Tuscans lay. But meanwhile axe and lever have manfully been plied, and now the bridge hangs tottering above the boiling tide. Come back, come back, Horatius, loud cried the fathers all. Back, Lartius, back, Herminius, back ere the ruin fall. Back darted Spurius Lartius, Herminius darted back, and as they passed beneath their feet they felt the timbers crack. But when they turned their faces and on the further shore saw brave Horatius stand alone, they would have crossed once more. But with a crash like thunder fell every loosened beam, and like a dam the mighty wreck lay right athwart the stream. And a loud shout of triumph rose from the walls of Rome, as to the highest turret tops was splashed the yellow foam, and like a horse unbroken when first he feels the rain, the furious river struggled hard and tossed his tawny mane and burst the curb and bounded, rejoicing to be free and whirling down in fierce career, battlement and plank and pier rushed headlong to the sea. Alone stood brave Horatius, but constant still in mind, thrice thirty thousand foes before and the broad flood behind. Down with him, cried false Sextus with a smile on his pale face. Now yield thee, cried Lars Porsena, now yield thee to our grace. Round turned he as not deigning those craven ranks to see, not spake he to Lars Porsena, to Sextus not spake he. But he saw on Palatinus the white porch of his home, and he spake to the noble river that rolls by the towers of Rome, O Tiber, Father Tiber, to whom the Romans pray, a Roman's life, a Roman's arms, take thou in charge this day. So he spake, and speaking sheathed the good sword by his side, and with his harness on his back plunged headlong in the tide. No sound of joy or sorrow was heard from either bank, but friends and foes in dumb surprise, with parted lips and straining eyes, stood gazing where he sank. And when above the surges they saw his crest appear, all Rome sent forth a rapturous cry, and even the ranks of Tuscany could scarce forbear to cheer. But fiercely ran the current, swollen high by months of rain, and fast his blood was flowing, and he was sore in pain, and heavy was his armor, and spent with changing blows, and oft they thought him sinking, but still again he rose. Never I ween did swimmer in such an evil case struggle through such a raging flood safe to the landing place. But his limbs were borne up bravely by the brave hearts within, and our good father Tiber bare bravely up his chin. Curse on him, quoth false Sextus. Will not the villain drown? But for this stay ere close of day we would have sacked the town. Heaven help him, quoth Lars Porsena and bring him safe to shore, for such a gallant feat of arms was never seen before. And now he feels the bottom, now on dry earth he stands, now round him throng the fathers to press his gory hands, and now with shouts and clapping and noise of weeping loud he enters through the river gate borne by the joyous crowd. They gave him of the cornland that was of public right, as much as two strong oxen could plow from morn till night. And they made a molten image and set it up on high, and there it stands unto this day to witness if I lie. It stands in the comitium, plain for all folk to see, Horatius in his harness, halting upon one knee, and underneath is written in letters all of gold how valiantly he kept the bridge in the brave days of old. And still his name sounds stirring unto the men of Rome, as the trumpet blast that calls them to charge the Volsian home, and wives still pray to Juno for boys with hearts as bold as his who kept the bridge so well in the brave days of old. And in the nights of winter, when the cold north winds blow, and the long howling of the wolves is heard amid the snow, when round the lonely cottage roars loud the tempest's din, and the good logs of Algatus roar louder yet within, 
when the oldest cask is opened and the largest lamp is lit, when the chestnuts glow in the embers and the kid turns on the spit, when young and old encircle around the firebrands close, when the girls are weaving baskets and the lads are shaping bows, when the goodman mends his armor and trims his helmet's plume, and the good wife's shuttle merrily goes flashing through the loom, with weeping and with laughter still is the story told, how well Horatius kept the bridge in the brave days of old. The Eve of St. Agnes by John Keats St. Agnes' Eve, ah, bitter chill it was. The owl, for all his feathers, was a cold. The hare limped trembling through the frozen grass, and silent was the flock and woolly fold. Numb were the beadsman's fingers while he told his rosary, and while his frosted breath like pious incense from a censer old, seemed taking flight for heaven without a death, past the sweet virgin's picture, while his prayer he saith. His prayer he saith, this patient holy man, then takes his lamp and riseth from his knees, and back returneth, meager, barefoot, wan, along the chapel aisle by slow degrees. The sculpture dead on each side seemed to freeze, imprisoned in black, purgatorial rails, knights, ladies, praying in dumb oratories. He passeth by, and his weak spirit fails to think how they may ache in icy hoods and males. Northward, northward he turneth through a little door, and scarce three steps, ere music's golden tongue flattered to tears this aged man and poor. But no, already had his death bell rung. The joys of all his life were said and sung. His was harsh penance on St. Agnes' Eve. Another way he went, and soon among rough ashes sat he for his soul's reprieve, and all night kept awake for sinners' sake to grieve. That ancient beardsman heard the prelude soft, and so it chanced, for many a door was wide, from hurry to and fro. Soon up aloft the silver snarling trumpets began to chide. The level chambers, ready with their pride, were glowing to receive a thousand guests, the carved angels, ever eager-eyed. Starred where upon the heads the cornice rests, with hair blown back, and wings put crosswise on their breasts. At length burst in the argent revelry, with plume, tiara, and all rich array, numerous as shadows, haunting fairily the brain, new stuffed in youth, with triumphs gay of old romance. These let us wish away, and turn, soul-thoughted, to one lady there, whose heart had brooded all that wintry day on love, and winged St. Agnes, saintly care, as she had heard old dames full many times declare. They told her now how upon St. Agnes' Eve young virgins might have visions of delight and soft adorings from their loves receive upon the honeyed middle of the night. If ceremonies do, they did aright, as supperless to bed they must retire, in couch supine their beauties lily white, nor look behind, nor sideways, but require of heaven with upward eyes for all that they desire. Full of this whim was thoughtful Madeline, the music yearning like a god in pain. She scarcely heard. Her maiden eyes divine, fixed on the floor, saw many a sweeping train pass by. She heeded not at all. In vain came many a tiptoe, amorous cavalier and back retired, not cooled by high disdain, but she saw not. Her heart was otherwhere. She sighed for Agnes' dreams, the sweetest of the year. She danced along with vague, regardless eyes, anxious her lips, her breathing quick and short. The hallowed hour was near at hand. She sighs amid the timbrels and the thronged resort of whispers in anger or in sport. Mid looks of love, defiance, hate, and scorn, 
hoodwinked with fairy fancy, all a mort, save to St. Agnes and her lambs unshorn, and all the bliss to be before tomorrow morn. So purposing each moment to retire, she lingered still. Meantime, across the moors had come young Porphyro, with heart on fire for Madeline. Beside the portal doors, buttressed from moonlight, stands he, and implores all saints to give him sight of Madeline, but for one moment in the tedious hours that he might gaze and worship all unseen, perchance speak, kneel, touch, kiss, in sooth such things have been. He ventures in, let no buzzed whisper tell, all eyes be muffled, or a hundred swords will storm his heart. Love's feverous citadel, for him, whose chambers held barbarian hordes, hyena foemen, and hot-blooded lords, whose very dogs would execrations howl against his lineage, not one breast affords him any mercy in that mansion foul, save one old beldam, weak in body and in soul. Ah, happy chance, the aged creature came, shuffling along with ivory-headed wand, to where he stood, hid from the torch's flame, behind a broad half-pillar, far beyond the sound of merriment and chorus bland. He startled her, but soon she knew his face, and grasped his fingers in her palsied hand, saying, Mercy, Porphyro, hide thee from this place. They are all here tonight, the whole bloodthirsty race. Get hence, get hence, there's dwarfish Hildebrand. He had a fever late, and in the fit he cursed thee and thine, both house and land. And there's that old Lord Maurice, not a whit more tame for his gray hairs. Alas, me, flit, flit like a ghost away. Ah, gossip, dear, we're safe enough. Here in this armchair sit and tell me how. Good saints, not here, not here, follow me, child, or else these stones will be thy bier. He followed through a lowly arched way, brushing the cobwebs with his lofty plume, and as she muttered, well a well a day, he found him in a little moonlight room, pale, latticed, chill, and silent as a tomb. Now tell me where is Madeline, said he. Oh, tell me, Angela, by the holy loom, which none but secret sisterhood may see when thy St. Agnes wool are weaving piously. St. Agnes, ah, it is St. Agnes Eve, yet men will murder upon holy days. Thou must hold water in a witch's sieve, and be liege lord of all the elves and fays to venture so. It fills me with amaze to see thee, Porphyro. St. Agnes Eve, God's help, my lady fair the conjurer plays this very night. Good angels her deceive, but let me laugh a while. I've mickle time to grieve. Feebly she laugheth in the languid moon, while Porphyro upon her face doth look, like puzzled urchin on an aged crone, who keepeth closed a wondrous riddle brook, and spectacled she sits in chimney nook. But soon his eyes grew brilliant when she told his lady's purpose, and he scarce could brook tears at the thought of those enchantments cold in Madeline asleep, in lap of legends old. Sudden a thought came like a full-blown rose flushing his brow, and in his pained heart made purple riot. Then doth he propose a stratagem that makes the beldam start. A cruel man and an impious thou art. Sweet lady, let her pray and sleep and dream alone with her good angels, far apart from wicked men like thee. Go, go, I deem thou canst not surely be the same that thou didst seem. I will not harm her by all saints, I swear, quoth Porphyro. O may I ne'er find grace when my weak voice shall whisper its last prayer, if one of her soft ringlets I displace, or look with ruffian passion in her face. Good Angela, believe me by these tears, or I will even in a moment's space awake with horrid shout, my foeman's ears, and beard them, though they be more fanged than wolves and bears. Ah, why wilt thou affright a feeble soul, a poor, weak, palsy-stricken churchyard thing, whose passing bell may ere the midnight toll, whose prayers for thee each morn and evening were never missed, 
Thus plaining doth she bring a gentler speech from burning Porphyro, so woeful, and of such deep sorrowing that Angela gives promise she will do whatever he shall wish betide her weal or woe, which was to lead him in close secrecy even to Madeline's chamber, and there hide him in a closet of such privacy that he might see her beauty unespied, and when perhaps that night a peerless bride, while legions fairies packed the coverlet, and pale enchantment held her sleepy-eyed. Never on such a night have lovers met, since Merlin paid his demon all the monstrous debt. It shall be as thou wishest, said the dame. All cates and dainties shall be stored there, quickly on this feast night, by the tambour frame, her own loot thou wilt see, no time to spare, for I am slow and feeble, and scarce dare on such a catering trust my dizzy head. Wait here, my child, with patience, kneel in prayer the while. Ah, thou must needs the lady wed, or may I never leave my grave among the dead. So saying, she hobbled off with busy fear. The lover's endless minutes slowly passed. The dame returned and whispered in his ear to follow her, with aged eyes aghast from fright of dim espial. Safe at last, through many a dusky gallery, they gained the maiden's chamber, silken, hushed, and chaste, where Porphyro took covert, pleased amain, his poor guide hurried back with eggs in her brain. Her faltering hand upon the balustrade, old Angela was feeling for the stair, when Madeline, St. Agnes, charmed maid, rose like a rose like a missioned spirit unaware, with silver tapered light and pious care, she turned and down the aged gossip led to a safe level matting. Now prepare young Porphyro for gazing on that bed. She comes, she comes again like a ring love frayed and fled. Out went the taper as she hurried in, its little smoke in pallid moonshine died. She closed the door, she panted all akin to spirits of the air and visions wide, no uttered syllable or woe betide. But to her heart, her heart was voluble, paining with eloquence her balmy side, as though a tongueless nightingale should swell her throat in vain and die heart stifled in her dell. A casement high and triple arched there was, all garlanded with carven imageries of fruits and flowers and bunches of knotgrass, and diamonded with panes of quaint device, innumerable of stains and splendid dyes, as are the tiger moth's deep damasked wings, and in the midst, among thousand heraldries and twilight saints, in dim emblazonings, a shielded stutchion blushed with blood of queens and kings. Full on this casement shone the wintry moon, and threw warm gules on Madeline's fair breast as down she knelt for heaven's grace and boon. Rose bloom fell on her hands, together pressed, and on her silver cross soft amethyst, and on her hair a glory like a saint. She seemed a splendid angel, newly dressed, save wings for heaven. Porphyro grew faint, she knelt, so pure a thing, so free from mortal taint. And on his heart revives, her vespers done, of all its wreathed pearls, her hair she frees. Unclasped her warm jewels one by one, loosens her fragrant bodice, by degrees her rich attire creeps rustling to her knees. Half hidden like a mermaid in seaweed, pensive a while she dreams awake and sees in fancy fair Saint Agnes in her bed, but dares not look behind, where all the charm is fled. Soon trembling in her soft and chilly nest, in sort of wakeful swoon, perplexed she lay, until the poppied warmth of sleep oppressed her soothed limbs and soul fatigued away, flown like a thought until the morrow day blissfully havened both from joy and pain, clasped like a missile, where swart paynims pray, blinded alike from sunshine and from rain, as though a rose should shut and be a bud again. Stolen to this paradise and so entranced, Porphyro gazed upon her empty dress and listened to her breathing, if it chanced to wake into a slumberous tenderness, 
which when he heard, that minute did he bless and breathed himself, then from the closet crept, noiseless as fear in a wide wilderness, and over the hushed carpet, silent, stepped, and tween the curtains peeped, and lo, how fast she slept. Then by the bedside where the faded moon made a dim silver twilight, soft he set a table, and half anguished threw thereon a cloth of woven crimson, gold, and jet, over some drowsy Morphian amulet, the boisterous midnight, festive clarion, the kettle drum, and far heard clarinet. Affray his ears, though but in dying tone, the hall door shuts again, and all the noise is gone, and still she slept an azure lidded sleep, in blanched linen, smooth and lavendered, while he from forth the closet brought a heap of candied apple, quince, and plum and gourd, with jellies soother than the creamy curd, and lucent syrups, tinct with cinnamon, manna, and dates, in argosy transferred from fez, and spiced dainties every one, from silken samarkand to cedared Lebanon. These delicates he heaped with glowing hand on golden dishes, and in baskets bright of reused silver. Sumptuous they stand in the retired quiet of the night, filling the chilly room with perfect filling the chilly room with perfume light and now my love my seraph fair awake thou art my heaven and i thine eremite open thine eyes for meek saint agnes sake or i shall drowse beside thee so my soul doth ache thus whispering his warm unnerved arm sank in her pillow shaded was her dream by the dusk curtains was a midnight charm impossible to melt as iced stream. The lustrous salvers in the moonlight gleam. Broad golden fringe upon the carpet lies. It seemed he never, never could redeem from such a steadfast spell his lady's eyes. So mused a while in toiled in woofed fantasies. Awakening up, he took her solo lute, tumultuous, and in chords that tenderest be, he played an ancient ditty, long since mute, in province called La Belle Dame Sans Merci, close to her ear touching the melody. Wherewith disturbed, she uttered a soft moan. He ceased. She panted quick, and suddenly her blue afraid eyes wide open shone. Upon his knees he sank, pale as smooth sculptured stone. Her eyes were open. But she still beheld, now wide awake, the vision of her sleep. There was a painful change that nigh expelled the blisses of her dream so pure and deep at which fair Madeline began to weep and moan forth witless words with many a sigh, while still her gaze on Porphyro would keep, who knelt with joined hands, piteous eye, fearing to move or speak. She looked so dreamingly. Ah, Porphyro, said she, but even now thy voice was that sweet tremble in mine ear, made tunable with every sweetest vow, and those sad eyes were spiritual and clear. How changed thou art, how pallid, chill, and drear. Give me that voice again, my Porphyro, those looks immortal, those complainings dear. Oh, leave me not in this eternal woe, for if thou diest, my love, I know not where to go. Beyond a mortal man, impassioned far at these voluptuous accents, he arose, ethereal, flushed, and like a throbbing star seen mid the sapphired heaven's deep repose, into her dream he melted as the rose blended its odor with the violet, solution sweet. Meantime the frost wind blows like love's alarum, pattering the sharp sleet against the window panes. St. Agnes' moon hath set. Tis dark, quick pattereth the flaw blown, quick pattereth the flaw blown sleet. This is no dream, my bride, my Madeline. Tis dark, the iced gusts still rave and beat. No dream, alas, alas, and woe is mine. Porphyro will leave me here to fade and pine. Cruel, what traitor could thee, cruel, what traitor could thee hither bring? I curse not, for my heart is lost in thee. Though thou forsakest a deceived thing, a dove forlorn and lost with sick, unpruned wing, 
my Madeline, sweet dreamer, lovely bride, say may I be for I, thy vassal blessed, thy beauty's shield, heart-shaped and vermeil dyed. Ah, silver shrine, here I take my rest, here will I take my rest, after so many hours of toil and quest, a famished pilgrim saved by miracle, Though I have donned, I will not rob thy nest, saving of thy sweet self, if thou thinkest well to trust, fair Madeline, to no rude infidel. Hark, tis an elfin storm from fairyland, of haggard seeming but a boon indeed. Arise, arise, the morning is at hand. The bloated wassellers will never heed. Let us away, my love, with happy speed. There are no tears to heed or eyes to see. Drowned all in Rhenish and the sleepy mead. Awake, awake, arise, my love, and fearless be, for o'er the southern moors I have a home for thee. She hurried at his words, beset with fears, for there were sleeping dragons all around. At glaring watch, perhaps with ready spears, down the wide stairs a darkling way they found. In all the house was heard no human sound, a chain-drooped lamp was flickering by each door. The arras, rich with horsemen, hawk and hound, fluttered in the besieging wind's uproar, and the long carpets rose along the gusty floor. They glide like phantoms into the wide hall, like phantoms to the iron porch they glide, where lay the porter in uneasy sprawl with a huge empty flagon by his side. The wakeful bloodhound rose and shook his hide, but his sagacious eye an inmate owns. By one and one the bolts full easy slide. The chains lie silent on the foot-worn stones. The key turns, and the door upon its hinges groans. And they are gone. Ay, ages long ago these lovers fled away into the storm. That night the baron dreamed of many a woe. And all his warrior guests, with shade and form of witch and demon and large coffin worm, were long benightmared. Angela, the old, died palsy twitched with meager face to form. The beadsman, after a thousand abs, told, for I unsought for slept among his ashes cold. The Raven Once upon a midnight dreary, while I pondered, weak and weary, over many a quaint and curious volume of forgotten lore, while I nodded, nearly napping, suddenly there came a tapping, as of someone gently rapping, rapping at my chamber door. "'Tis some visitor,' I muttered, tapping at my chamber door. Only this and nothing more. Ah, distinctly I remember it was in the bleak December, and each separate dying ember wrought its ghost upon the floor. Eagerly I wished the morrow, vainly I had sought to borrow from my books surcease of sorrow, sorrow for the lost Lenore, for the rare and radiant maiden whom the angels name Lenore. Nameless here forevermore. And the silken, sad, uncertain rustling of each purple curtain thrilled me, filled me with fantastic terrors never felt before, so that now, to still the beating of my heart, I stood repeating, "'Tis some visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, some late visitor entreating entrance at my chamber door, this it is, and nothing more. Presently my soul grew stronger, hesitating then no longer. Sir, said I, or madam, truly your forgiveness I implore. But the fact is I was napping, and so gently you came rapping, and so faintly you came tapping, tapping at my chamber door, that I scarce was sure I heard you. Here I opened wide the door. Darkness there, and nothing more. Deep into that darkness peering, Long I stood there, wondering, fearing, doubting, Dreaming dreams no mortal ever dared to dream before. But the silence was unbroken, 
and the stillness gave no token, and the only word there spoken was the whispered word, Lenore. This I whispered, and an echo murmured back the word, Lenore, merely this and nothing more. Back into the chamber turning, all my soul within me burning, soon again I heard a tapping somewhere louder than before. Surely, said I, surely that is something at my window lattice. Let me see then what thereat is and this mystery explore. Let my heart be still a moment and this mystery explore. Tis the wind and nothing more. Open here I flung the shutter, when with many a flirt and flutter in there stepped a stately raven of the saintly days of yore. Not the least obeisance made he, not a minute stopped or stayed he, but with mien of lord or lady perched above my chamber door, perched upon a bust of palace just above my chamber door, perched and sat, and nothing more. Then this ebony bird beguiling my sad fancy into smiling by the grave and stern decorum of the countenance at war. Though thy crest be shorn and shaven, thou, I said, art sure no craven, ghastly grim and ancient raven wandering from the nightly shore. Tell me what thy lordly name is on the night's Plutonian shore, quoth the raven. Nevermore. Much I marveled this ungainly fowl to hear discourse so plainly, though its answer little meaning, little relevancy bore. For we cannot help agreeing that no living human being ever yet was blessed with seeing bird above his chamber door, bird or beast upon the sculptured bust above his chamber door, with such a name as Nevermore. But the raven, sitting lonely on the placid bust, spoke only that one word, as if his soul in that one word he did outpour. Nothing farther then he uttered, not a feather then he fluttered, till I scarcely more than uttered, Other friends have flown before, on the morrow he will leave me, as my hopes have flown before. Then the bird said, Nevermore. Startled at the stillness broken by reply so aptly spoken. Doubtless, said I, what it utters is its only stock and store, caught from some unhappy master, whom unmerciful disaster followed fast and followed faster, till his songs one burden bore, till the dirges of his hope that melancholy burden bore, of never, nevermore. But the raven, still beguiling all my fancy into smiling, straight I wheeled a cushioned seat in front of bird and bust and door. Then upon the velvet sinking I betook myself to linking, fancy unto fancy, thinking that this ominous bird of yore, what this grim, ungainly, ghastly, gaunt and ominous bird of yore meant in croaking, nevermore. This I sat engaged in guessing, but no syllable expressing to the fowl whose fiery eyes now burned into my bosom's core. This and more I sat divining, with my head at ease reclining on the cushion's velvet lining that the lamplight gloated o'er, but whose velvet violet lining with the lamplight gloating o'er, she shall press, ah, nevermore. Then, methought, the air grew denser, perfumed from an unseen censer, swung by seraphim whose footfalls tinkled on the tufted floor. Wretch, I cried, thy God hath lent thee, by these angels he hath sent thee respite, respite, and repent thee from thy memories of Lenore. Quaff, O oh, quaff this kind, repent thee, and forget this lost Lenore quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, 
said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, whether tempter sent, or whether tempest tossed thee here ashore, desolate yet all undaunted on this desert land enchanted, on this home by horror haunted, tell me truly, I implore, is there, is there balm in Gilead? Tell me, tell me, I implore, quoth the raven, nevermore. Prophet, said I, thing of evil, prophet still, if bird or devil, by the heaven that bends above us, by that God we both adore, tell the soul with sorrow laden, if within the distant Aden it shall clasp a sainted maiden, whom the angels name Lenore, clasp a rare and radiant maiden, whom the angels name Lenore. Quoth the raven, Nevermore. Be that word our sign of parting, bird or fiend, I shrieked, upstarting. Get thee back into the tempest and the night's plutonian shore. Leave no black plume as a token of that lie thy soul hath spoken. Leave thy loneliness unbroken. Quit the bust above my door. Take thy beak from out my heart and take thy form from off my door. Quoth the raven. Nevermore. And the raven, never flitting, still is sitting, still is sitting on the pallid bust of Pallas just above my chamber door. And his eyes have all the seeming of a demon's that is dreaming, and the lamplight o'er him streaming throws his shadow on the floor. And my soul from out that shadow that lies floating on the door shall be lifted nevermore. Yeah.